Is the Northern Ireland? I declare the meeting open to the public. Sorry, Mike. We, we have quorums. So we were just starting there, so. Um, so uh, I want to advise you now that there there are five members in the room and two meetings attending via Starleaf. So we have got everybody today. So the following members are present in person: myself, Emma Sheehan, the chair; Mike Nesbitt, our vice chair; Paula Bradshaw, Michelle McElveen, Christopher Stalford, and we have John Dowd, who's attending in his capacity as County Collins deputy on Starleaf, and Mark Durkin as well on Starleaf. So I want to uh, remind all members that their mobile phones should be on Wi-Fi to avoid interference with video conferencing, and we are being broadcast live throughout Parliament buildings as well as online. So agenda item one. We have, we don't have any apologies because we're all here. So agenda item one, we have a briefing on particular circumstances by Dermot Nesbitt and Dermot's joining us in person. So uh, we can welcome Dermot to the room. So the, there's a clerk's memo to accompany this on page five of your meeting packs. And this is followed by Dermot's written submission along with the framework convention for protection of national minorities. Dermot, how are you? Hello, Madam Chair. Ooh. Do you want to do a wee round of introductions before you start, or do mm. you just start your briefing? I'm ready once I get a... <laughs> <laughs> let's you, let you get some down first. Once I unmask <laughs> and uh, a wee glass of water. Of course. And I recognise a few faces. <laughs> Oh dear, says I. <laughs> Hi Paula. Long time. Yeah, well, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, so we, we all have your written submission, which is useful yep. and um, all encompassing. But if you want to begin, sure, share away. Okay. Well, I see we have two on screen. We do. So Mark Durkin. And uh, John O'Dowd is Hi, Mark. on screen as well. Hi, John. Hey, Dermot. Hi, Dermot. Hi, all right. Okay, yeah, ready to go. Right. right, well, I wish to make just a couple of introductory comments before I proceed, because, in fact, it was in paragraph two and three of my submission where Professor Bryce Dixon, who was then chair of the Human Rights Commission, he said, and I quote, we are all familiar with the phenomenon of politicians taking a view of human rights, which happens to accord with their personal political persuasions, rather than a more independent analysis. So I wish to say at the outset, I have endeavoured during this process since 1998 to ground my work on international standards and international human rights. I've tried to be take the maximum is the plain meaning of the language, what it means and what we should do. I've tried to be objective, I've tried to be evidence-based, and that is why I've used extensively quotations in my submission, including quotations from what I have written as well. Because I firmly believe if we deal with this difficult issue in the phrasing of international law, it removes it from the the local lingo, the political lingo, and therefore I, I, that's my outset, that I, I'm doing that. And therefore I welcome cross-party questioning of my submission on the basis of that premise that, I, that I've given. So I, I intend to say briefly three aspects, put it in context, what it is we're about, then look at what the two key players have done or not done namely the Human Rights Commission and the two governments. And then I'll give a summary of my comments at the, at the end of my submission. <clears throat> so, there were, in the talks process, three strands. There was north-south, east-west, and within Northern Ireland. But there was also a third strand, the cross-strand issue. In other words, issues that cut across the three strands. And I was the lead person for that from a point of view of the Ulster Unionist Party. So I don't deny I'm a unionist, not at all. But that's different from the articulation of what I'm trying to say to you as well. So therefore, I, I take 
a key issue, which was identity. And who better could I use to identify that problem than what Senator George Mitchell said, who was chairman of the all-party talks in 1998. And he was very clear, and he said this in 2019, that identity remains a threat to stability. And there must be a clear commitment to address this matter. I quote also from the Belfast Telegraph, it was in paragraph eight of my submission, where it said in its editorial, if this is to be a shared space, then respective identities must be respected. So there's the word identity cropping up, not from a certain perspective, but a general position. Therefore, the question is, what rights do we need to address to address that particular issue? Now, when the talks, there, there was a, an election to a forum in 1996 from which the participants to the talks process came. And at that time, the Irish government sponsored a forum for peace and reconciliation to give advice to those participants in the talks. And they brought in international experts to formulate that advice. And I quote extensively from two of those experts. Again, international context. Ajon Aidi, he is viewed as a leading international expert. He was an active member of a committee in, the, in Norway and also in the United Nations. And what did he say? So let's establish the problem. He said, often, and it's the most difficult problem to resolve, that you get two groups with uh, an ethnic dimension where they compete and conflict over the same territory. Two groups, ethnic groupings, conflict over the same territory. And he said what happens there is they say we are discriminated against, they say that we are second-class citizens, they seek parity of identity to be recognized, and parity of esteem. That's what he was saying, and those words found their way into paragraph four of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And then he also said that what they may have wished for, apart from that, they would have wished maybe for separation, for autonomous, or even for merger with a neighboring state. Now we can recognize those dynamics in the Northern Ireland problem. And the thing he also said was that it is not a unique problem. He said there's very few countries in the world that have a homogeneous ethnicity to their population. So it's not a unique problem. The dynamics are there, they're clear, and Northern Ireland fits within that. So where do we go from there? What is the solution? Well, Ajon Aidi said, and I quote it very clearly, from the Council of Europe, there was the framework convention for the protection of national minorities. And he said that that was indeed uh, the first multilateral hard law, hard law meaning that whatever country ratifies it, they must subscribe to giving submissions as to how they've complied with that law. First multilateral hard law dealing exclusively with minority rights. He also said it went further than any other previous international instrument. So that was a substantial one. The first one and went further than anywhere else. But not only let's not just take uh, Ajon Aidi, I also quote from another uh, Forum for Peace and Reconciliation document, and that was written by Professors Boyle, Campbell, and Haddon. I'm very conscious Professor Boyle, the late Professor Boyle, was a leading activist in the civil rights movement in the 60s. So I'm not quoting from unionist persona, as it were, I'm trying to be genuinely objective. And what did they say? Again, I, I, I quote it in paragraph 14. They say, yes, um, there are individual rights in the European Convention, but community rights must also be addressed. And they said they may best be addressed by the Framework Convention within a Bill of Rights. There it is, simple, in 1996. Now, they also said as well, I've quoted, that 
we're not to sort of way, all these rights are now enshrined in international law. And it's not for us to barter as to whether or not we accept, which bit we accept, which bit we don't. They are there to be subscribed. And as we know now, and I smile as I say it, international law over the summer, and I wrote this in May 2020, that international law has featured everywhere from Nancy Pelosi to all over the place. We must subscribe to international law. You cannot do anything other. Gee whiz, says I. Wonderful to hear them say it. Whereas I've been saying it for quite a long time, subscribed international law. So there it is. Now I reflected on these, because at the time I was a member of the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights. It was succeeded by the Human Rights Commission. And they got involved in this as well. And I reflected on these submissions, and I agreed with them. They were the correct, balanced way forward. It required compromise from both sides. It required some pragmatism if we were to make progress. And of course, at the time, I just gave it briefly, I said here briefly, I wrote in September 1996, quote unquote, were all the participants in the talks to abide by international consensus as to how to solve our problem of a divided society. Progress could be made. I challenged the government in June 97, again in a platform article in the local paper, to ratify this convention, which they weren't doing. They were ignoring it. And I said in that article, it should be within a Bill of Rights and that the European Convention and the Framework Convention give the European model for solving this problem. Again, the international perspective. And finally, and I smile at this, I really do smile at this, I wrote in January 1998, whenever the Westminster government ratified it, I wrote, this represents potentially the most significant development. Now, the word potentially is interesting because that means a development into something in the future. Now, if someone had told me 22 years later, I'd still be here looking for it to be developed, I'd have said, cut yourself on, mate. <laughs> 22 years. So I say it again, it's potentially the most significant way forward. Um, but briefly, I just say, what is the Framework Convention? So is it's on the record and you get a flavor. Well, it prohibits discrimination. It preserves culture and identity. It promotes mutual respect for all. And individual or members of a minority community can assemble. They can associate. They can have freedom of thought, freedom of religion. They can communicate in the language, they can communicate in the media, publicly, privately, written, and orally. They're not precluded from anything. And they can display signs in private, and street names, and they can use their own name. As regards education, apart from recognition of having education, they can do it in the minority language. There should be the working together of teacher training, and collaboration of the community so as they understand each other. All of this is written in the Framework Convention. And as well, cross-border participation is mentioned in the Framework Convention. No state should stop people coalescing across the border, either individually or in a collaborative organization. And that the governments themselves should set, set up multilateral and bilateral agreements across across the borders between states. So there we have it. The rights are there. They're clear. Also in the Framework Convention, to have those rights, there is or are associated obligations. And those obligations have to be met, in a sense, to fully subscribe to the rights. And the key obligation I mentioned is respect for the territorial integrity of the state respect for the territorial integrity of the state. So that's the position. Now, what about the UK government and the Irish government? The second point, and I'll briefly deal with the third point. Um, they viewed Northern Ireland as unique. It's not unique. Of course, if you think something is unique, 
then you have to find maybe some unique solution that gives you a reason to, to maybe not do the correct thing. And I gave you an example of what it was. I think it shows the words. There may be some models that might contain certain elements which could be used. How evasive and how sort of waffly. And yet they said that in February 98 when they had ratified this framework convention. So they weren't a one bit enamored. And not only the bit about recognition not being there to a great extent, from a point of view of international law, and that's back to very topical, and again, I'm conscious of, a, of when I wrote this, they were very reluctant to deal with international law. Both the UK and the Irish government wrote a paper, paragraph 33, 34, I think it's in, where they said they would have regard to international law. Now, having regard as saying, well, we look at it, we might and we might not deal with it. It took a little persuasion. I'm not saying I did it entirely, but it took a little persuasion. And eventually, in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, what did they say? They would ensure that international obligations are met. That's somewhat different. So we've now got a position, and this is where you, as an ad hoc committee, are important. There's a key fundamental international instrument called the Framework Convention that the governments have ratified, including the Irish government that committed to do it in the Belfast Agreement, and also the UK government is to ensure that those international commitments are met. So that's a challenge to your committee to ensure the government does that, because it ain't doing it, Madam Chair. What about the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission? Well, it, I believe, got it wrong as well. It, it, uh, yet Professor Bryce Dixon made it clear that it was a head of steam to have a lot of rights. It was a great variety of supplementary rights. We must have all these supplementary rights. And yet, Professor Tom Haddon, he concluded he was on the Human Rights Commission the first five years. Another professor, senior academics, they all are, and he said that the Human Rights Commission seriously misunderstood what was expected or intended by the agreement in 1998. They seriously misunderstood. And I, who is one who participated, would entirely agree with them. And that's why I would welcome your questioning if you wish to do so. Then we come to the next chairman, Professor Monica McWilliams. She took an honourable position. She said, look, work is based on securing the highest level of rights for all people in Northern Ireland. What, what else would you expect from the Human Rights Commission? But the bit I didn't like was where she said, it's not some tick box to the Belfast Agreement, we'll do this, this, and this. That's most disrespectful of an agreement that was agreed across this island of Ireland by the majority of people, and she viewed it as some tick box exercise to the Belfast Agreement. Even today, the Human Rights Commission has said that this 2008 submission is a strong basis to proceed. So they aren't in any way changing their position. So what's my commentary? And briefly, the third part I said I would come to. And I'm watching the clock You're as well. Team. Yes, I know, but it's nothing crystallised the mind more than <laughs> thinking of a deadline. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. So I view that the pathway to progress is clear, very clear. My views are also clear. I wish to subscribe to international conventions. Same as elsewhere, same rights, same obligations as elsewhere. Nothing more, nothing less. And it's that simple, as I put in my submission. It's that simple. And yet, and the language is also very clear. If I explain that identity, it's defined as culture, language, education, and religion. Clear. Ethos, that's clear. It's the characteristics of a community as regards their attitudes and aspirations. That's ethos. And parity of esteem, what's that? Parity of esteem is equal respect for
for the identity, ethos, and aspirations of the community. Very clear, very simple. Now, I know that some have wished, still wish, to have a much more expansive Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. But you cannot avoid what the law says. You are mandated first and foremost to implement the law. And it's simple that you must apply the law as written. As I said at the beginning, my maxim is the plain meaning of the English language. And it is there. It is clear. It is plain. It is simple. And yet, I add in the balance of that, I have no doubt the sincerity of those who wish to have a wider Bill of Rights. No doubt. Indeed, can we find a compromise between the wider spectrum that some clearly wish and what the precise law says? I believe we can find a compromise, and perhaps that can come up in, in the discussion. OK? But if we do not find a balance and a compromise, then progress won't really be possible. And only with a balanced position will we need progress. I'm very con conscious of what Christopher Stolford, Christopher, what you said when Dominic Grieve said about if we can get an agreed position. Westminster couldn't say no to us, really. Mm. And you said that was one of the most key statements he made to find a compromise position between the breadth that those who wish and the more strident, clear-cut, uh, mandated by law. And that's what you, you as a committee need to find, and that's what I would like to, to, to discuss. Um, final few words, aspiration, that's fully recognized by the nationalist community, for the nationalist community and the Good Friday Agreement, no problem there. That's there. But we needn't go too far. You need to go no further than Scotland or Wales, I say. Take Scotland, very strident separatist party, the Scottish National Party. Nicola Sturgeon, a very, very, I wouldn't wish to fall out with Nicola. I never met her, never met her, but she's, I see you're smiling, Chairman. <laughs> Have you met her? I haven't, no. no. I haven't. Well, she's very strident, but yet the point I make is they respect the principles of international law, Scottish National Party. So you have to go no further than, than Scotland. And yet I say as a unionist, I agree entirely with what Michelle O'Neill said. There is, and I quote, there is no alternative to respect, equality, power sharing, and the Good Friday Agreement. I agree, but you can't pick and choose. You take it all, and that's where the problem might be. So, where do we go from here? Well, I think there is a need for a Bill of Rights. The Framework Convention lays down the mandate or the template for that, and from that template comes legislation, and from the legislation comes action by the various participants in the political process and in government structures, and then you uh, then consider and judge whether or not they are implementing it and what needs implemented. Those, Madam Chair, are my uh, introductory comments. And I do genuinely, dare I say it, I hope I don't regret it when I, when I finish, but I do genuinely look forward to a discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and that was um, interesting, very interestingly delivered. Um, you, you said at the outset there the importance with which you view international law, and I, I, I know I picked out a wee part of your submission where you, you said that the UUP's response at the time, and I'm conscious that this is quite quite a while ago. Can you hear me? Quite, yeah, quite a while ago. Um, that, that the UP at the time wished for the same rights and the same level of stability based on the same principles as are applied elsewhere in Europe. Um, I'm conscious you referred there to the fact that you had written the submission in May and you, you made references to the conversation that's been had at the moment about international law. But I just wondered if you think uh, Brexit and leaving the EU is going to have any impact on this and, and what you think that is? Oh, yes. Brexit 
because of changes. We don't live in a, a society that never changes. Brexit will change the situation generally. But the issues and the problems that were identified in 1998, and I'll come to what Les Allenby said, maybe because I don't agree with him, those issues are still there. We still have a community. Let me give you two quotations, and I give you a balance in those quotations of where we are. Alban McGuinness wrote in 2019, 14th of August, Belfast Telegraph, my birthday. <laughs> but anyway, the failure of politicians to develop a coherent political model that produces hope and respect and good politics cannot inspire young people. So the problem is still there, notwithstanding Brexit. And I'll give you one other quote, which is maybe even more uh, doleful. Alex Kane, writing in the 31st of August, he said, reconciliation is tortuously slow. Indeed, I'm not even convinced it is moving at all. The best my generation has come up with is stalemate. Now, when you think about that, Alba McGuinness, the politicians are not giving anything about identity and respect to the younger people. We're in stalemate. That problem, Chair, is still there, notwithstanding that there is a changed society with Brexit. And of course, it brings in some aspects of the uh, Charter of European Rights and the European Convention. Uh, it, it remains with the Charter's European Union. It disappears, but that doesn't preclude one saying, what are these? This is where we come to where you can have expansive rights if you so wish. So I recognize there are changes, but I also say there is a problem that is still there and needs to be addressed. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll pass to Mike as Vice Chair. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, Dermot. Um, can I take you back to 98? And <clears throat> Yesterday. The, the reference to, to a Bill of Rights. I mean, my reading of it seems to be that, that, that what the agreement said was, we will take the European Convention on Human Rights as the foundation for our regard to what we want to do. But then we will then task people to take a look at the scope for adding to that some rights which would reflect the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Was that a compromise position, or did all the parties think that was the, the best way to go? Well, it was agreed, and the peoples of the island of Ireland agreed it, that yes, there was recognition that there's a European Convention of Human Rights, but that's the individual rights, and as you saw what I've written to reflect the talks process, but there needed to be something to deal with community, yeah. group, or minority rights, so you had to add that on. Yeah, but that, that's my point. Because it's not your position, certainly not today, because your position today is that there are two foundations, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Framework Convention for National Minorities. Yes, there were those two, but, but they were to be integrated, as I said in my article, take the two of them and they form the model for Europe. The European Convention on Human Rights, and you build upon that, as it says, drawing as appropriate on international instruments and experience, these additional rights to reflect the principles of mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and parity of esteem. I remember Friday the 9th of April 1998 when we got a copy of the document and I went through the bits that I viewed as relevant. I remember reading that and I was content with what it said, mindful of what had been said in the various uh, committees and mindful what I put in print, which I've given here, because there's, a, there's an old saying that the, the proof of the pudding is, is in the eating. Well, I say that the, the proof of the argument is in the written word. And I was content with what it said. Right, there are two written words that we've been debating for 22 years, and they are particular circumstances. Yes. Was that constructive ambiguity? No, it wasn't ambiguous in a sense, because uh, when you say the, the particular circumstances, it said, if you read it very carefully, uh, the Human Rights Commission be invited to consult and to advise and scope for defining rights supplementary to those to reflect the particular circumstances. Then it says, 
these additional rights, and that means these supplementary rights to do with a particular circumstance, what are they? Mutual respect, identity, and ethos and parity of esteem. I've said to you, it's very clear what they are. Identity is culture, language, education, religion. Ethos is about uh, a, a community as to what it aspires to and what its attitudes are. And part of esteem is respect for identity, ethos, and part of and aspirations. So it's very clear. If people wish it to be clear, it is clear. And this is where I'm somewhat amazed <clears throat> that we have senior legal academics who, well, I shall watch what I say, but they are rather ambiguous in their interpretation. Okay. At the time of April 98, did all the negotiators have the same analysis of what particular circumstances means as you do today? As I did then and still do today, to, to be precise. Okay. All I know is, and I can't say what a person's mind is, can't say that, but I know what was written. I know that I was content with it on the Thursday the 9th before the Friday of the 10th, the Good Friday. And at that meeting, when we met on the Friday, there was a bit of toing and froing before we met. And I remember we all, oh, it was fascinating in a sense. But then we got round the table and George Mitchell went round the various parties and they agreed to it, except to be quite frank, Sinn Féin said they would have to consult. But since then, I quote Michelle O'Neill, who says that we can only go for respect, equality, and the Good Friday Agreement. And I say yes, but you can't pick and choose what bits you want and which bits you don't. But the bit that I'm dealing with, I'm content with, and I remember the parties agreeing. And now, whether behind the scenes they may have liked it or not, that's a different matter. But even more important than that, the agreement was put to the peoples of the island of Ireland on the 22nd of May 1998, and it was agreed, which is quite unique to have two referenda, two parts of the island of Ireland, and it's one agreement by all. In your presentation, you, you talked about your belief that there's a compromise between maybe the narrow definition in the 1998 agreement and those who want, shall we say, an all singing, all dancing Bill of Rights. Yes. And that, that's interesting. It's obviously something that this committee is going to have to try and come to a view on. What I'm interested in is, is the elements that might go into a Bill of Rights. And the more I'm reading into this, the more I'm hearing, I'm thinking that the, the preamble is extremely important because it would represent us giving a vision of how we want our society to be in the future, and that would be based uh, on a series of values. In other words, what we want to promote and what we want our society to, to be free of. And from that would flow then the actual rights, our entitlements, and the obligations uh, of the state. And, f and from that, finally, uh, you, you would have, therefore, individuals who say those are my rights, communities saying these are my rights, and politicians saying these are my obligations. Is that how you would see it? Yes, I, as I said to you, I see that the, um, the Bill of Rights should lay down the template, but there were maybe up to 30 rights within the Framework Convention. Compared with what the uh, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission did with respect to the particular circumstances, it was minimal. Maybe the question will come up, but I would like to, to go through why I think the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission got it totally wrong. And the need, truth to power needs to be said. Sorry, you got it wrong. You better recognize that if we're going to make a compromise. Do you want me to go through it? or? Well, I think, I think I'm aware, but... Hmm? Hmm. Don't mind. Yes? <clears throat> you want me to go through, through it? Please. Well, look, it's, it's very simple. Well, it's lengthy, but... Quite simple. If you look at what the Human Rights Commission submitted in 2008, you know, the right to life, the right to fair trial, the right to marry, the right to health, 
the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to accommodation, the right to work, environmental rights, social security rights, children's rights, a plethora of rights. But in there was a little amount dealing with, and I quote, the right to identity and culture. Minimal. Now, if you look at that right in those aspects in the submission, they had six rights within that identity culture dimension in the 2008 document. Six. Take the first one. What does it say? The right of the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both. Well, that didn't come from the rights section of the Good Friday Agreement. It came from the constitutional section of the agreement. So it wasn't anything to do with rights. In fact, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission were open when they made a statement, and it's very clear what they said. They said that this particular right that we're dealing with, quote, does not reflect any international human rights standard. Does not reflect any international human rights standard. Yet, according to the agreement, it is meant to uh, take international human rights, drawing upon international human rights. So it doesn't reflect any. And, and the irony of that is a bit like conflating. The irony of that is you could have an Irish identity and identify as British. They're not mutually exclusive. So in a sense, that particular first right is not a relevant right to what they were meant to do. And yet they've put it under identity and culture. And, and, and the second one is equally the right of people of Northern Ireland to hold British or Irish citizenship, or both. And, and that doesn't apply either, because I need to go into detail. Take the third one. What does it say there? And this is the third one under identity and culture. Public authorities must fully respect identity and ethos of both communities. And where do they say they take that from? They take that directly from the Belfast Agreement. So all that third right is doing is literally repeating what's in the Belfast Agreement. It's not giving any rights. It's just a repetitive statement. And those three rights are, 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 are of no consequence, in a sense, to dealing with what needs to be addressed. Culture, language, education, and rights. And I could go on, but I, 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 I don't want to take up your time in that, but, but I, I just would like to mention something, because I was very conscious. I listened to, to Les Allenby on this matter, and this is like truth to power as well, because he's still defending the human rights position of that. Now, what did he say? Yes, he said, and this was the 19th of March, I listened to it, transcribed it, that uh, he says, we're committed to a Bill of Rights is in the Belfast Agreement. And then he said, I must, and then he read out paragraph four, the very one you're dealing with. And he said, there's a fair bit there to unpack. Well, it's not a fair bit to unpack. It's quite clear and simple. But more substantive than that, he said, are we looking at 1998 or are we looking at 2020? And personally, he says, I think it is clearly the latter. So he, in a sense, and then he went on to say, the idea of somehow trying to go back to the future and say, let's remind ourselves of what the situation was in 1998, is very dismissive of 1998. He said, we're now in a very different position. So therefore, and I've quoted you, Alba McGuinness, Alex Kay, and you see what I've said by George Mitchell in The Telegraph. Yes, 1998, and we are in a changed position from then, but the problem of 1998 is still there. And then Dr. David Russell, my final comment on, on the human rights submission to you on the 19th of March. Dr. Russell said, advice was provided. That's what he said to you. And then he went on to say, the mandate, that's their mandate, is complete. And I say, sorry, Dr. Russell. Your mandate was not complete. You did not subscribe to the law as written in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So 
I would say, and I've said it in the document, as you're saying, try to find a compromise. I would recognize, yes, we can have additional rights. Let's see them. But also we need a recognition by the Human Rights Commission, a recognition reality, I would call it, that they did not provide what the law stated they were to provide. There's Alamy. We're in a very different position. Let's start in 2020. I say, yeah, 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 you can look at that. But 1998 is still with us. Now, how might you get over it? I'll give a suggestion to you on this aspect. If you take the law, and they use this law, in paragraph 41 I quoted in my submission, paragraph 41, what the law says is Article 69.3 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. The Commission shall advise the Secretary of State and the Executive Committee after receipt of a general or specific request, which it got under Section 7 of the Northern Ireland Act, which was to request the Commission to, advise, to provide advice according to Paragraph 4 of the Good Friday Agreement. So it got specific advice. Then in B it says, on such other occasions as the Commission thinks appropriate, it could provide advice. And what does such other occasions mean? That means occasions other than the specific advice. So what I would suggest that it could do is, at the very least, the Commission should recognise and have a separate section dealing with paragraph four. That would recognise the importance of it, it would recognise the meaning of section four and its importance, and it would provide comprehensive advice, not their minimalist advice that they did provide. And then if they wished, you as a committee, you might decide to have a separate section. Back to Christopher Stolford, can we find a balanced position? Um, where you say, okay, let's take the law and say, here is another occasion where we think we want to provide advice. Wider ranging rights is two separate aspects. And um, that's a way forward. That is a clear way forward, but I am very clear. They, su they supplied a minimalist subscription to the law, yet that's what they were mandated to do. And they subscribed a more maximalist set of rights for which they were not mandated to do. And the interesting, and even this final point, Belfast Good Friday Agreement is an international treaty. Therefore, guess what? It's international law. Guess what? You wouldn't be surprised if I said, hey, Human Rights Commission, you're in breach of international law. Thank I've you, heard that before, but I haven't heard that said too many times publicly. But I believe, and I challenge them. Next time Les Allenby's in front of what? the executive next time Les Allenby's in front of the executive committee, you might. <laughs> well, well I would Thank you very much. <laughs> Chair, thank you. No problem, mate. Um, Nobody else has indicated, but Sorry. Paula, do you want to move Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, what struck me when you were talking there about 1998 and, and what's enshrined in law and where we are as a society now, 22 years later, um, would it be, po this is probably a wild, but should the law, that, should that section not be amended then? If we, if we once we do this inquiry, um, and consults with people and it comes out that they want more of an expansionist that maybe even moves away from the um, particular circumstances and wants to include things like environmental rights and other socio-economic rights that maybe weren't originally envisaged. Would one way of getting around it be that we would up, um, amend the 1998? Oh, you could amend the 1998 uh, legislation. Nothing precludes amendments to legislation. Well, what I'm saying is, you cannot overlook. What overlook is sorry, overlook or overall. You cannot overlook what is contained in paragraph four of the Good Friday Agreement, because, as I say, 
those rights need to be laid down. The template is there from the Framework Convention. The experts from Haddon, Campbell, the late Professor Boyle, Ajon Heidi, the Forum for Reconciliation from Dublin said that's what should be done. And that is what should be done, but that has been overlooked in its entirety almost by the Human Rights Commission. They were very minimalist. So I'm not saying don't amend the law, but I'm giving you a way of doing it without actually having to amend the law, because the law says on such other occasions as the Commission thinks appropriate. So on such another occasion, we could say, well, there's paragraph four. There's a fully comprehensive uh, set of rights that we recommend should be implemented according to international law, but also because circumstances have changed. Uh, here is, we think, other rights that we think appropriate under section 69.3b. It also it already gives you permission within the law to provide other rights without having to amend the law. Okay. Because if, uh, emphasize, if you amend the law, you're potentially diminishing the intent hmm. of paragraph four of the Belfast Agreement that was agreed by referenda okay. in Ireland. Yeah, Paula. Thank you, Dermot, and thank you. It was, it was lovely listening to it. That was really interesting, actually. Um, I think uh, there's faint echoes here in terms of what we're discussing and what's going on in Capitol Hill at the minute in terms of people discussing how different ways that the, that the law should be interpreted. Should it be interpreted as the authors intended, or should it be interpreted as a means of providing a platform for activism? I think that's it's, it's an interesting conversation. At least I think it's interesting, others probably don't. <laughs> but um, I think the sort of central lesson that I, I've drawn from what you've said and is that we have overcomplicated things. And it's a very nebulous concept, you know, a Bill of Rights, and we're tasked with trying to draw up a Bill of Rights. And I think maybe we have overcomplicated it ourselves. Uh, I don't know who I offended. I interrupt, who's the we? The Assembly. Right. Um, I don't know who I offended in 2008, but I was actually on the Bill of Rights Forum, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw how that spiralled completely out of control in terms of the recommendations that were produced. And it was clear that there were various sectional interests who were party to that uh, forum, to that process, who saw in the Bill of Rights a means of achieving for themselves things that they wouldn't be able to achieve through conventional political means, like lobbying to get legislation passed and stuff like that. So I suppose my question is, in terms of, are you suggesting then that we have the, the Framework Convention and the European Convention, and that basically should be our template, and we should be trying to translate that into domestic legislation? Well, um not so much because there have been changes. In fact, Les Allenby, Les Allenby said, and I quote him, where he said, um, the closest thing we have to supplementary rights to the Convention is the European Charter, because it takes the European Convention and builds into that additional rights. But by him saying that, he's overlooking entirely the Framework Convention and the rights of, of, a, of a national minority. Mm. But you're right about the forum. You were on it, Paula was on it, I was on it. This is probably the first time since then the three of us have sat around, <laughs> sat around a table. It seems like yesterday, That's 2007, right. 13 years ago. Oh dear me. Uh, so you're right, it was maximalist. Yes. It ran away with itself. And that's why I still say, if, and it needs a balance, it needs a compromise, it needs recognition, reality was the phrase I used, by both sides. Mm. In other words, the Human Rights Commission should recognize the reality that it didn't subscribe to paragraph four. But those who were taking the minimalist view should perhaps recognize, yes, we should have additional rights, mm. because this is an opportunity to have additional rights, and you can have it under 69. 3B, mm. but this is what we think we should do. But when you suggest additional rights, you don't go for everything. Yes. As I say, progress in any political world can be made 
where there is pragmatism and a recognition by, by both sides. I, I, I see John O'Dowd there. I, I think he may remember he said at one of these meetings that uh, he, he tries to understand the viewpoint from the other side. I think John said that. And this is where we have to see the viewpoint from the other side. I can see what Monica Williams wished for. But I say, Monica, let's just be a little bit realistic. But also, you have to recognize, Monica, that you did subscribe mm. to Article 4, and that's back to Paul. As if you try and amend the law, you're diminishing what was in the law. Yeah. Okay, Chris, sir. Yes. Michelle? Okay, thank you. Um, and I was interested to ha hear how you would find balance. I was interested to know how you would find balance and compromise. But interestingly, and I, I found your paper really, um, really fascinating, but you have quoted academics and politicians. And really, I suppose what I want to know is how you build consensus among communities, particularly amongst those who are perhaps sceptical to what a Bill of Rights would look like in practice. That's a difficulty with the political, and I'm not downgrading politicians, because I was one. <laughs> That's a difficulty with politicians per se, that the community has perhaps to a certain extent mm -hmm. lost faith in anything they try to do. And I, and I quoted from uh, Bryce Dixon where he said, there was a groundswell in 2001. Oh, we need a Bill of Rights, great, great, great. Uh, and therefore, I think what you have to do is those who make the decisions, and I would consult with the Human Rights Commission because it, it's an important body dealing with it, that you and it could find a compromise within the law where they have to recognize certain things. And if, we, if you could find an agreement, it's a bit like even with, dare I say it, COVID at the minute and, and the executive and I, I'm sitting in the outside. If you can find agreement, the people might be behind you. Part of the problem might be at the moment with COVID is that some people say, well, they can't get agreement as to what to do. Our schools, you get um, the Minister of Education saying they will be open on the 2nd of November. Yet someone else says the executive has to agree to them being opened again on the 2nd of November. So it wasn't just quite simple. And therefore, if you give a confused message, that doesn't help. Your fundamental question is how do you bring the people with you? Answer, you get a simple, clear message mm -hmm. that you've agreed with the main actors. And one of the main actors, apart from this committee, which is a very important one, is the Human Rights Commission. And if you can get your act together collectively with a clear, simple message, then the people, if they're not behind you, they'll certainly not condemn you. Okay, thank you. All right, Michelle. I think John has indicated on the screen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, a very interesting presentation, Dermot. I don't know if you remember or not, but you and I spent a long summer together in 2006 on the preparation for government committee, which was the public dynamic which led to the negotiate or the agreement at St Andrews. Yes. Uh, and I found your contributions then insightful, thoughtful, uh, provocative at times, but always measured. Uh, and, and, and I note you're still as sharp as a tack and still negotiating <laughs> across these issues. But um, you, you, you have give a very interesting presentation. But your the, the the basis of your presentation is that everybody else has got it wrong, that the Human Rights Commission have got it wrong. I think you refer to eminent barristers and eminent legal minds have got it wrong. That the the call for a Bill of Rights was a very narrow uh, interpretation of Clause Four, which you refer to. So I think that there, there has to be a challenge to you around that. But also then, if we accept your interpretation that the Human Rights Commission got it wrong, they were asked by the British government to advise them on the way forward. The British government didn't have to take that advice. The British government could have brought forward a Bill of Rights. And to date, they haven't brought forward any Bill of Rights. So the British government have failed in their duty under the international agreement. Well, that's, that, that's yes. And, and you did make that comment, I remember as well. Because you said they've, they've, they've now like set a pattern for not agreeing with international law. That was the bit you added whenever you said that at a previous committee meeting. Uh, so therefore, I, I'm conscious of that point having been made. However, 
Um, the British government were conscious, Dominic Grieve referred to this as well, and this is the point, that the British government were looking for consensus for something they would bring forward. They did not see consensus. They saw disagreement among the parties. Mm. You use the phrase there, a narrow interpretation of paragraph four. I would say it's not a narrow interpretation of paragraph four. I would say paragraph four is precisely defined and that we should interpret it as defined. Now, some say interpreting it as it's defined is narrow. Yes, it's narrow compared with the breadth of rights for the whole community. But at that time, it was an issue that George Mitchell has said, Alex Kane, um, and various other ones have said, today still needs to be resolved. So I'm not ducking the issue. I, I'm not saying you're saying that I am ducking the issue. But I'm saying, yes, we need to address paragraph four because it's an important element needing to be addressed. And we can consider wider ones. And yes, I remember in 2003, 4, 6, those committees, and I have the document that I submitted, and I think the document is in accordance with what I'm saying today as well. I've not changed my opinion. No, uh, and the remarks that you have, um, uh, your, your contributions obviously have been always useful and, and contributed to where uh, we are today. In, in terms of the, the rights of identity, and you refer to the Good Friday Agreement gives people the right to identify as Irish or British, but the recent de Souza case proved that that right needed to be legally enforceable, and it isn't legally enforceable. So perhaps the Human Rights Commission in their original uh, draft legislation were correct to identify it as a right that needed legal protection. Two points on that. First of all, that right deals with the, all members of the community, not just the two. And whenever you say the law needed adopted, well, I was very clear in 1998 when I agreed to the Belfast Agreement that the law said that anyone born in the United Kingdom whose parents were a resident, perhaps even in the United Kingdom, they were automatically entitled to British citizenship. In fact, the argument when I went to court was that when you're born, you have to be automatically something. You shouldn't have to fill in to be something. And then the law allowed you to say, no, I don't want to be British and apply for Irish. And they've changed the law, which I agree with you, from the Europe to a European position where they don't have to, as it were, renounce uh, British citizenship uh, for the Emma, Emma D'Souza to bring her partner who was a United States system or a United States citizen. So the law somewhat changed, but, but the point you make, the law is there, so, and it's wider rights. We're dealing with aspects that are not there in law, namely the community rights of culture, language, education, religion. It's not there in a Bill of Rights, and there's no law to reflect that in, in, in its entirety in Northern Ireland. So I agree with you, their comments, Emma D'Souza, but I say the, the detail of the argument with regards to Emma D'Souza makes it still not relevant to a Bill of Rights. Uh, okay, thank you. It's good to see you again, Dermot the Doc. Yourself, okay? Okay, good to see you. To you, John. Mark, I think you had your hand up there as well. Oh, you're muted. It's your way. Sorry. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for that, uh, Dermot. Just uh, one wee point. You're a wee bit critical there of the, the Human Rights Commission's views on what a Bill of Rights should address. But just to take one example, I mean, they cite that around a fifth of people here in Northern Ireland have a disability. And if I cast my mind back, not that many years ago, not as far back as, as you've been casting it already today, but they, just a few years ago when we were uh, looking at the welfare reform, Bill, all parties here, nationalist and unionist, were making the case here and in London that our higher proportion of people with disabilities had to be understood in the context of post-conflict society. So I was just wondering how that balances, uh, you know, it seems maybe a wee bit artificial to view what you quite rightly say or describe as valid concerns 
for every society or for any society apart from the conflict and its enduring structural and, in many cases, personal effects? Well, yes, uh, disability is very important, and I would not uh, at one moment say there shouldn't be rights for that. I'm just saying put it in context as to where it should be and not minimise, which the Human Rights Commission did, the rights that should have been considered under paragraph 4 of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So, you, you know, I, 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 I'm glad you mentioned that because I would not want to give the impression that I'm against any of those other rights I've listed. Not at all. Oh, no, 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 I, I didn't get that impression. <laughs> Sorry, Dermot, but it was just, you know, can these all be viewed completely separately from our shared experience or the, the conflict here? Well, they may not be separated from the conflict, and there's a lot of aspects of the victims of terrorism, who's a victim, and all of these debates as to what has been the ongoing repercussions of the terrorist or the violent campaign. And they are all very significant, very important, very sensitive, and some people feel very concerned that they haven't been addressed. Uh, the compensation for victims and all of that is very, very difficult. So I, I'm not trying to, to diminish that, but I'm saying that the, the Bill of Rights, paragraph four, was identity, ethos, parity of esteem. Now, identity, as defined by international law, is your culture, your language, education, your religion. And even the Human Rights Commission said about the citizenship, nowhere in international law does it refer to that aspect of a right. And the actual law says that they are meant to draw as appropriate on the on international instruments. Well, there isn't an international instrument to deal with citizenship as such, for example. So I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying we have to be very careful. I believe, I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying I believe that the law is quite clear and we must, as it were, take the letter of the law and implement it. But that does not, and I keep repeating, preclude other aspects being considered, which you have mentioned. Okay, thanks, Emma. Okay, Mark, good to see you. Problem, Mark. That's us. Is that us? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, that was that was really useful, and I just personally I want to thank you for your presentation and for your, for your wait, time and your insight. And I think probably everyone is unanimous in that. I wish you well, and if you want to have me back, don't hesitate to invite me. Brilliant. I think the last time I seen you, Dermot, was in Cross Gar. Jeez. I was walking past, the, you were in the front garden, it was the 12th that, of July, um, and I was walking past with my son, and you were sitting out in the deck chair watching that. That was, uh, <laughs> yes, that was, it was a my, good day, actually. That was my was parents' there. home, which is now my daughter's home. Oh, very good. Uh, you know, <laughs> and it was built in my grandparents' farmland, so, like, my I go back there, building, right? generations. <laughs> I have no relation to his either. <laughs> no, we, we're not related because we couldn't agree who'd be the elder brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, I shall leave. Thank That's you. Thank you very Thank much. You, we take our wee ease for a, a wee mm -hmm. moment. This is... Members, we're back in public session. Um, so our next uh, briefing, agenda item three, is a uh, briefing again on the particular circumstances this time from Mark Durkin, and Mark is joining us via Starleaf. I don't know if he's here. He is. Hello, Hello Mark. Good afternoon. Thank, thank, thank you very much for, for joining us, um, and, and thanks for the submission that you've sent us. So if you want to begin... With your, with your briefing? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Well, essentially, I was asked to maybe address this question about the wording in paragraph four in terms of uh, particular circumstances uh, of Northern Ireland. But uh, as you can see from the submission, uh, I believe that you can't look at the whole question of what the Good Friday Agreement 
uh, intended or offered in terms of a Bill of Rights just by looking at that uh, paragraph. You have to look at the many different references that there are in different parts of the agreement to the issue uh, of rights. Uh, so I don't believe that we can. you can say that references to rights in other parts of the agreement, and particularly the strong language in which they are expressed, can be ignored for the purposes of a very narrow interpretation of paragraph uh, 4. But if we look to paragraph 4 itself, uh, it is clear that what was envisaged and intended was that uh, a Bill of Rights would wrap around uh, the European Convention of Human Rights. So the European Convention of Human Rights was going to be part of uh, the suite of rights that would be there in the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights wasn't an optional extra uh, alongside the European Convention, but the idea was that the European Convention was a base starter given at the time of the uh, agreement, while work would have to continue uh, on looking at what other additional uh, and supplement or supplementary rights might have to be uh, expressed in a Bill of Rights. It's also key to the wording of paragraph four that is quite clear that it was Westminster who was to legislate for a Bill of Rights. And the idea of that was to offer some sort of guarantee that a Bill of Rights of itself wasn't going to require absolute all-party agreement. Uh, it wasn't going to rest on the Assembly or the Assembly parties all to approve or to agree, because otherwise a Bill of Rights would never be uh, agreed or achieved. So the idea of being able to offer a degree of entrenchment, and as so far as it could be given under what may be called British constitutional law, was to say that Westminster would legislate for this Bill of Rights. And this was on the basis of Westminster also in this agreement uh, being committed to uphold uh, the European Convention on Human Rights and indeed to legislate for the European Convention into uh, domestic law so that it would actually be accessible in the Northern Ireland courts. And remember, paragraph two of that section of the agreement gives a very clear cut a commitment by the British government as to what incorporation of the ECHR in domestic law was to mean, including giving people the right to go to court and actually overturn assembly legislation uh, for being incompatible. So that was an extremely uh, strong uh, commitment in relation to what the European Convention of Human Rights was to mean. Uh, and of course, currently, some members may take us on to this, Currently, of course, the Internal Market Bill uh, confounds that because it removes the right of people uh, to go to court to uh, overturn uh, legislation if a Minister of the Crown has directed differently. And indeed, the Internal Market Bill actually gives Ministers of the Crown the right to overrule Assembly legislation, uh, whereas the Good Friday Agreement was only giving people here the right to go to the courts to have Assembly legislation uh, overruled. So, what is happening at the minute does confound what was provided for in the Good Friday Agreement in terms of the European Convention and the Bill of Rights. And I listened to, uh, earlier to Dermot. Uh, I listened to Dermot all through the talks in 1998. And to borrow a phrase, he said, if somebody had told me then that 22 years later um, I would be listening to Dermot Nesbitt talking about these things, <laughs> I'd have said, you're probably right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and if they did say it, they, they, they are now right. But uh, the fact is, I don't go along with this idea that the Bill of Rights was going to have the European Convention uh, elevated uh, as far as applicability in the courts, as far as justici justiciability is concerned, but that the additional or supplementary rights wouldn't carry that same weight. And I don't believe that many other people who agree the agreement in 98 uh, agreed that. But when you look at the different parties that were there, and remember, Anything to get approval in the agreement always needed a majority of the parties, not just parties representing a majority. Uh, so many parties there had very strong commitments to uh, a Bill of Rights. Yes, they had different ideas uh, as to what degree of expression and reach there should be uh, in such a Bill of Rights, but they all were very clear that a Bill of Rights uh, was something that uh, was necessary. But we knew that in the circumstances of the talks, we couldn't agree the details of a Bill of Rights. 
any more than we could agree the detail of the new beginning to policing. And so some aspects of work that were agreed in the agreement were actually handed on for successor consideration, such as the International Commission on Decommissioning, such as the Commission uh, to look at policing, the Commission for the Criminal Justice Review, and of course the Human Rights Commission being charged with its role in bringing forward advice on a Bill of Rights, but it also had a role to consult on a Bill of Rights uh, as well. And never in giving the Commission that sort of consultative role uh, were any of us thinking, oh, and that means you can only consult within the absolute narrow definition uh, of uh, paragraph uh, four. I also would make the point that some of the language in paragraph four does reflect uh, issues that were being argued at the time, such as around the question of group rights or communal rights. And in particular, those issues were being argued in relation to the marching issue, uh, which, of course, for a series of summers uh, in the 1990s, was causing a huge difficulty. You know, with some years, the place was going into convulsions uh, over uh, marching tensions. Uh, and there were different arguments about which rights uh, applied where in terms of group rights, community rights, uh, an identity or whatever. So that's why that language uh, is there without being pointed in one direction or another. And similarly, the reason why a general phrase like particular circumstances is used was so that we weren't upcasting particular breaches or violations or transgressions of rights that people could point to uh, in ways that would then be uh, argued over. And then you get into a whole symmetry of what about right, about what things you do. So this general approach of referring to the particular circumstances uh, was used, and particularly to avoid uh, referring to it as the unique circumstances. And you've, you've heard from a previous witness who had a particular aversion uh, to uh, any shorthand references to the unique circumstances or unique conditions of Northern Ireland or on the island uh, of Ireland. So particular circumstances was used in that sort of way. But I would also make the point that paragraph four appears in a section of the agreement, which, funnily enough, begins with paragraph one. And while paragraph four is a declaration on behalf of the British government uh, and its commitment as to what it would do to bring forward uh, a Bill of Rights, paragraph one, of course, is a statement by all of the uh, participants, uh, where we affirm a commitment to mutual respect, the civil rights and religious liberties of everyone in the community. Against the background of the recent history of communal conflict, uh, the parties are firm in particular. And then there are a series of rights, which also includes the right to equal opportunity in all social and economic activity, regardless of class, creed, disability, gender, or ethnicity. And you find similar language uh, also in paragraph three, which is dealing with specifically with equality uh, questions. And equality and human rights were being dealt with, not because they were seen as completely separate uh, issues, but because uh, parties, and in particular, I would have to say, the Secretary of State at the time, Mo Molam, were very committed to making sure that difficulties in creating change and implementation in one shouldn't get in the way of uh, the other. And Mo Molam had particular ideas around creating a, a combined equality commission, which a lot of the parties didn't agree with at the time, and a lot of the pre-existing commissions didn't agree with it at the time, and were lobbying against uh, the idea of a combined uh, equality uh, commission. So some of the language that appears to separate uh, those issues is because there were going to be different issues about how the transition and the implementation uh, would be managed and would be achieved. But clearly the word rights uh, comes up quite a bit in a lot of the equality references uh, in the agreement. And I don't think that people were ever believing that when it came to a Bill of Rights, that that would completely ignore all of the equality standards and all of the uh, equality rights. Because in particular, if the Bill of Rights was going to make sure that the power that was being given to citizens under the European Convention to go to the courts to overturn uh, assembly legislation print compatibility, I think most participants believe that that would apply to any other right uh, that came forward under uh, the Bill of Rights. So as someone who was there in the negotiations, who was in the room for everything that 
uh, Dermot said and reacted to and that everybody else did. Uh, I feel that you know other parties had a different perspective and a different understanding uh, and maybe uh, a, a much broader idea as to what might come forward under a Bill of Rights uh, than Dermot did. In terms of the Framework Convention of Rights, uh, Dermot did refer to that a lot in the talks, uh, but that didn't go down well with a lot of participants in the talks, in the sense that it was framed in language that was talking about uh, national minorities. Uh, you know, we would be taking we would be taken on kind of comparative tours of other situations, and we'd be told about that in South Tyrol there was also a displaced national minority that thought itself to be on the wrong side of an international uh, border. Now, the idea of trying to say that that's a standard for looking at Northern Ireland, and the idea that parties around that table were only interested in the question of minority rights, the term minority rights doesn't appear uh, in those terms in the agreement, because people were trying to assert rights in their own terms, uh, in uh, their own rights. And, of course, and our understanding on rights has developed quite a bit uh, since then as well. So, while some rights uh, are uh, listed and offered, including in that declaration by all of the participants, uh, our understanding of many of those particular rights, and I heard the previous exchange in relation to the question of disability, uh, the whole understanding around uh, rights of people with disabilities uh, has developed quite a bit. We have moved from you know, a political process and governance that very much just thought condescendingly about the needs of people with disabilities uh, to now having to hear much more and respond much more uh, to the rights of people with disabilities. Similarly, uh, there is a whole uh, understanding developing around uh, environmental rights. Uh, children's rights aren't specifically mentioned in this part of the agreement, but remember one of the things the First Assembly did was bring forward the legislation to establish the Children's Commissioner. And there was a lot of argument about the wording of that legislation, uh, because that was one of the bills where we needed to get approval from the Secretary of State, because we wanted the Commissioner to be able to uh, look at juvenile justice issues, and of course they were then not uh, devolved. Uh, so we needed the Secretary of State's approval, and we were in a situation where the then Secretary of State wasn't going to approve Assembly legislation for a Children's Commissioner if that legislation referred to the rights of a child. So we're told we can't have rights, uh, that all we can have is welfare or best interests. Now, as it happened, we ended up with a bill that refers to welfare rights and best interests. But the fact is, uh, our understanding on rights, even in the early days of uh, devolution, extended and moved. And I think it would be wrong to say, for instance, that the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission or the public with whom it was consulting shouldn't actually be allowed to come forward with some more developed ideas around what should or shouldn't be in uh, a Bill of Rights. And of course, in the negotiations, we looked at other examples of uh, Bills of Rights, and of course, many of us had been taken to South Africa and uh, had seen different experiences there. And there was different views as to the applicability, for instance, of the sort of uh, scope that was in the South African Bill of Rights. And yes, some people uh, did worry that that goes too far in terms of social and economic rights. Uh, some of them then also pointed out that the Bill of Rights in South Africa uh, was going to uh, be permanent and therefore would coexist alongside majority rule. And we're coming back at some of us and saying, well, if you, if you want a South African Bill of Rights, do you also want South African majority rule uh, as well? So those were the sort of exchanges and, and conversations that were taking place. And yes, there, were a diff there was a difference of view as to what people would want to see in a Bill of Rights, but there's no doubt in my mind uh, there was not unanimity uh, on the view that you have just heard, that we had a very narrow view, a very narrow expectation as to what would come from paragraph uh, four. But the key thing as well in that was that we did have, as the bird in the hand, that very strong commitment that even if we didn't get to a wider Bill of Rights, or even if we didn't get all we wanted in the wider Bill of Rights, we would have the European Convention on Human Rights. And the one other point I would make about my submission is I do refer to the fact that British governments have different secretaries of state, 
have justified the failure to legislate for the Bill of Rights on the basis that there wasn't unanimity, but they have also then justified it by saying, anyway, a bespoke Bill of Rights wouldn't make any difference because you already have the European Convention on Human Rights and you have the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And of course, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights has gone with Brexit, and we know that we can't rely on the on the current British government adhering to the European Convention on Human Rights, or even not moving to repeal it altogether. Mark, I'm not sure if he's frozen or... Oh, yeah. thank you very much. I wasn't sure if you had frozen or finished there. Um, no, so... don't want to <laughs> Uh, I, I, I appreciate that and appreciate your, your written submission as well. I have to say that um, it was probably one of the most entertaining of those that we've had thus far, the way that your use of alliteration and uh, some of the analogies that you, that you used were, were um, interesting to read and, and I, I did enjoy it. Most of the presentations that we have had, I've asked um, the, the presenters about the impact of Brexit. I'm very conscious that obviously as Perry and DNA we're uh, to consider the creation of a Bill of Rights faithful to 1998 and the particular circumstances, but also to look at the impact of leaving the EU on our particular circumstances and what that means. And I suppose you've stated quite clearly that you have concerns about the Internal Market Bill and the impact on, on the British government having uh, powers to, to change things that we decide here. And I'm just wondering, uh, what, what do you think, in terms of a Bill of Rights, how we could potentially plug those gaps that, that might be created by that and, and how a, a Bill of Rights could address any possibility um, of, of gaps because of, of Brexit or, or changes from the British government as a result of Brexit? Well, I'm not sure if a Bill of Rights itself can be used to uh, prevent every bit of potential overreach uh, by a British government in the future into devolved areas, because maybe some of the devolved areas that they would be trying to reach into in the name of the uniformity of the internal UK market uh, may not relate specifically to uh, any of the, the rights either under the Convention or any supplementary rights. So uh, I think it is important that we use a Bill of Rights to achieve the purposes that were intended in 1998, which was uh, to defend uh, citizens from any legislation that would breach uh, their rights, that would trespass uh, on their fundamental rights under the Bill of Rights, uh, and be able to do that in the domestic courts. And of course, the Internal Market Bill, as well as giving Ministers of the Crown the right to overrule uh, Assembly legislation, it also uh, precludes the right of people to go to, to court to challenge uh, any uh, of that. So. You know what was intended and understood around the European Convention and what it would mean in Northern Ireland domestic law uh, is uh, changed significantly by the Internal Market Bill, and that seems to signal it seems to be a trailer for more possible changes uh, in that sort of direction. So, you know, I do worry that you know the slippery slope uh, beckons, but we are paying a price for there not having been a Bill of Rights. If there had have been uh, a Bill of Rights. Uh, supplementing the European Convention and dealing partly maybe with framework convention issues around uh, some of those issues of, of identity, uh, but also addressing some other uh, issues of rights and maybe articulating uh, some of the European Convention rights in a much more applicable and current way uh, for the modern age, including, say, in respect of disability, children uh, or whatever. We uh, would have been in a much better position uh, to uh, say to a British government and the Westminster Parliament, you cannot legislate in the internal market bill or any other bill in the way that you are doing. Uh, you can't just simply knock away the European Convention on Human Rights commitments in the Good Friday Agreement as though that was a stud wall and not a key supporting wall uh, in the uh, agreement. You are interfering with the fundamental architecture and understanding of the agreement when uh, you do this. Uh, so a Bill of Rights, if it was achieved, uh, would have at least, I, th I think, created a more defined and definite position uh, around some of the issues that are arising uh, under uh, Brexit. But uh, even I, who take quite an expansive approach as to what a Bill of Rights might include, 
don't think that you could come up with a Bill of Rights that is absolutely about saying uh, we're going to prevent all possible trespass uh, by Westminster on the devolved uh, ambit. Uh, what I do think we need to do is to reaffirm what the devolved ambit in the agreement was meant uh, to be. Uh, and that affects both strand one and strand two, uh, actually. So I think in circumstances where even the people who have been big advocates of Brexit tell us it hasn't changed uh, the spirit, it doesn't change the spirit or the letter of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, I actually think we need to then invite those people to say, well, right, let's have a renewal review of the Good Friday Agreement and let's us see now uh, in 2020 and beyond how we're going to give meaning to the letter and spirit of the agreement, even post-Brexit. And that's the challenge uh, that we should put to them. Thank you very much, Mark. Mick, if you're happy, can we go to Mark H first, because he has to go? Yeah, of course. Is, is that all right? Mark, have you any questions, Mark H? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark. I enjoyed your submission as well. Sorry, I couldn't call around to the house to hear the chat about it. But... Current circumstances prevail, obviously. In the submission, Mark, uh, you referred to some quarters laying down the precondition of all party consensus for a Bill of Rights, which, as you say, wasn't set down as a precondition for the Policing Act or the St Andrews Agreement. Can you recall, and I don't doubt that you, <laughs> that you recall a lot, but can you recall anything from the negotiations that supports an interpretation of this being an implicit condition of a Bill of Rights? Uh, no, uh, I can't. There was there, there was nothing. I mean, as, as it said in my introduction, it was very deliberately cast that Westminster would legislate for the Bill of Rights. And remember, that wasn't just in uh, respect of paragraph two in that section of the agreement. It was also what was uh, intended in paragraph 33 of strand one, which makes a commitment that the Westminster <laughs> Parliament uh, will legislate to give effect to to uphold the inter United Kingdom's international obligations in respect of Northern Ireland. And everybody understood that to mean the European Convention uh, on Human Rights. And of course, some people also saw that as meaning the Framework Convention uh, as well. And indeed, there are other international obligations. But the idea of it being legislated for by Westminster was partly so that it wasn't going to require all party support uh, in the Assembly or outside of the Assembly. Uh, but it meant that nobody was going to be guaranteed absolute satisfaction that everything they wanted in a Bill of Rights was going to be in it, or that anything they didn't want to be in a Bill of Rights wasn't going to be uh, in it. But the clear commitment and uh, understanding uh, was there. And that wasn't just from Mo Molum, uh, that was from uh, Tony Blair as well, that was uh, understood. So. This argument was made afterwards that there needed to be all party uh, consensus. None of that was written into the uh, agreement. Nothing in the agreement says, said that even that there had to be an assembly stage of consideration in relation to the Bill of Rights or uh, anything else. What the agreement did provide for, of course, was that the assembly would be guided uh, in terms of its own work, its own legislation, by both the Equality Commission and by uh, the Human Rights Commission, but it didn't specify directly in relation to the Bill of Rights, but it did, uh, that strand one does refer to, and of course, uh, it was also allowing the Commission to support cases that could actually overturn Assembly legislation. Uh, so it would be odd if the uh, agreement that was giving such a powerful mandate to the Commission, uh, possibly even over uh, Assembly legislation, would actually say, but the Commission can only do its work with full approval from uh, the Assembly or can only get a start on the Bill of Rights. So it wasn't there, just as there wasn't, as I mentioned, there wasn't a requirement that there would have to be all party agreement in relation for policing, uh, just as there wasn't uh, all party agreement on St Andrews, just mm -hmm. as there was only one party agreeing to the Northern Ireland Offences Bill when, when it was introduced in 2005, even though that dealt with a very sensitive issue of legacy and victims. But the same government that brought in the Northern Ireland Defences Bill that was initially supported by one party, which then thankfully withdrew its support, was also at the same time saying, no, we need all party consensus on a Bill of Rights. So it's a, it was a dishonest position and it was a self-frustrating test that was introduced. 
No, uh, thank you, Mark. As, as Emma has said there, I have to nip on to another meeting, yeah, but sure, really I'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oh, all right, Mark. <laughs> hey. <laughs> sure, thank you. Hi, Mark. Uh, How are you? How are you, mate? So, Mark, I'm, I'm learning why um, it's particular circumstances and not unique circumstances. Uh, so does that mean a, an argument that w what we're looking at in Northern Ireland applies anywhere else in the world does not preclude it becoming part of a Bill of Rights? No, it, uh, no anything that applies in any other part of the world may be uh, applicable or adaptable. Uh, here within a Bill of Rights, and after all, the ag agreement does refer to uh, international conventions and, and instruments. You know, it does refer to other international examples, and so those could be from broad international conventions, or they could be from uh, more bespoke examples within particular uh, countries or whatever. As I said, because it was so current in the 90s, South Africa and the Bill of Rights there was one of the points that people were looking at. Uh, but you know there was a bit of there was a bit of pick and mix, uh, and not just on the part of a few parties. I mean, all parties maybe had a bit of pick and mix about how uh, applicable some parts of the South African Bill of Rights uh, were, and whether or not it fitted the context of the sort of inclusive government uh, that we were intending here as a permanent feature. Whereas in South Africa, of course, the government of national unity was only to be for one term, but the Bill of Rights was to be uh, enduring. So. Uh, it, it was entirely valid for people in the negotiations to offer uh, those examples and ideas and draw down on them. And we certainly didn't believe that we as political parties uh, had the full detail or mastery uh, of all of those, which is why we were happy to see that the mandate would be given to somebody like the Human Rights uh, Commission, who would consult and no doubt were going to take all sorts of academic uh, advice. Uh, and of course, parties had in a whole series of talks, both formal and informal, uh, had discussed issues around the Bill of Rights uh, many times. Uh, and we had been given enlightenment by people like Kevin Boyle and Tom Hatt uh, and others about comparative examples as to where Bill of Rights could work uh, to deal with different issues and uh, absolve uh, different apprehensions uh, that might be in the way of a political agreement and uh, of institutional acceptance. So. Yes, people, I think, are free to suggest uh, examples from other places that might be usefully applied in a Bill of Rights here. And people have also got the right to qualify how applicable or translatable they think some of those uh, examples are. Of course, now, Dermot was, was discussing concepts, if you like, such as mutual respect, parity of esteem. You were being a bit more concrete discussing, for example, parades, parading. Was there a list of concrete issues back in 98? Um, no, there wasn't. I mean, certainly there, uh, there may have been a litany of issues that people would refer to uh, in exchanges. Uh, and as I may be implied, you know, some of that may be good into a bit of uh, what about right. Uh, and that certainly meant that uh, those of us who were negotiating and any of the people who were going to have to be uh, drafting a text knew we're not going to get into uh, a whole list of examples uh, or issues because it just bogs us down in negativity in the past. It looks like finger pointing, uh, it looks like blaming rather than pointing the way to the future, which is why you know, the list of rights that were affirmed by the participants in paragraph one of that section of the agreement are about from here on. Uh, they're very much future looking. It's not in particular upcasting about issues of the past. Although clearly when you look at some of those rights, you can imply, you can infer that there were particular issues uh, that informed why that statement of rights uh, was uh, important, such as freedom from sectarian harassment, for instance, uh, right to choose where you live. Uh, so the, so there wasn't a list being circulated as such, but yes, parties either in their written submissions may have given uh, examples, and certainly in the verbal exchanges uh, would have given examples uh, of issues that they felt, you know, might have to be addressed in a particular way in Northern Ireland that 
they couldn't maybe see covered uh, just by the European Convention itself. Uh, they couldn't see being covered just by something like the Framework uh, Convention. And as I say, some people didn't like the concentration in the Framework Convention uh, on uh, minorities and national minorities, and not just because people weren't comfortable in the immediate context in the 19, of Northern Ireland in the 1990s of that, but also because people were thinking, well, if some of us actually want a change in constitutional status to United Ireland, we would want a better benchmark for rights in the United Ireland than just uh, the promise of good treatment from national minorities. Uh, that is in the Framework Convention. We would, we, would, we would want a higher benchmark than that. Uh, so uh, people had their views, shared their views and uh, their ideas, and we knew more work was needed, which is why the mandate was being given to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, but clearly on the basis that uh, the UK government would uh, legislate. And that might sound like, you know, two birds in the bush, but of course the bird in the hand that we had in the agreement was the clear commitment on the ECHR and what that was to mean in terms of its justiciability in the Northern Ireland courts. If there was a Northern Ireland bill added to the European Convention, does that change the nature of the relationship between the Human Rights Commission and the Assembly and Executive? Uh, it possibly, it, it, it arguably does. I mean, when we were negotiating the agreement, we, we saw the Human Rights Commission uh, as having um, a number of potentially impactful roles as far as the Assembly is concerned. One would be as a base during uh, legislation or maybe in response to a decision or action by a minister uh, or a department. Uh, two, the fact that uh, it was going to be able to support cases uh, that would be taken by people. Uh, so the agreement doesn't just say that people will, citizens will be able to uh, go to the court. Uh, it also creates a support resource of the Human Rights Commission who can help people uh, in taking those cases right to the point of being able to overturn assembly legislation. So that's a fairly significant uh, scope for the people negotiating the formation of an assembly and tending to be in that assembly to actually give to the Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, but we did. And of course, the and I'm sure the committee doesn't want to get bogged down in the whole issue of petition of concern uh, or anything else. But remember, the safeguard mechanism around petition of concern was not meant to veto. It was meant to trigger an assembly proofing exercise focused specifically on equality or human rights considerations. And by setting up a special ad hoc committee, that would then take evidence, and we envisaged that the key evidence uh, in such uh, a proofing stage uh, for legislation or some other government measure uh, would be the evidence that would come from the Human Rights Commission uh, and or the Equality Commission. And the idea, and the reason we didn't specify them in that paragraph of the agreement that refers to taking the evidence was because there wasn't yet agreement on whether or not there would be a single Equality Commission or we would have a continuation of the individual uh, equality uh, commissions that uh, existed. So we'd have got into very cluttery language uh, there if we'd have made specific reference uh, to the commissions there. So uh, for the sake of shorthand, we didn't make direct reference, but we all agreed that the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission would probably be the two telling uh, witnesses when it came uh, to such a proofing exercise triggered by a petition of concern. Uh, and it was a petition of concern. It wasn't a petition of objection or a petition of veto. It was a petition of concern to trigger that proofing system. Unfortunately, the 1998 legislation didn't properly translate that into law. Okay. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Okay. See you soon. Thank you, mate. Yes, thank you. Yep. So we have no other from the room. John, do you have any questions? He's mute. I don't know. He's, he's... Yeah, he must be on mute. Uh-huh. He's so mute. John, we can't uh, hear you. Can you hear me now? We can. Yep. Yep. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, yes. I was just saying thank you, Mark, for your presentation. Another very useful presentation, insightful, thought-provoking as well, uh, an interesting 
in your written submission as well, even in terms of that history of, of the negotiations of the Good Friday Agreement uh, is very useful. Uh, Mark, the, 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 the issue of, 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 a, of a Bill of Rights, and I think you've outlined quite correctly in terms that the British government's position shouldn't have been that they, they need consensus. They had an obligation under the treaty to bring in a Bill of Rights. But in terms of uh, where we are now, and the, we have the, this committee set up under NDNA, uh, we still have objections from certain sections of the community, whether they're muffled or, or more vocal, however it may be. Uh, w w what advice would you have for us in terms of moving forward as to how we we we, we have to make a dramatic leap, in my opinion, at this stage? We've been inching forward for far too long. But what advice would you have for the committee in terms of moving this process on? Well, thank you, John. I mean, well, one thing I would say is when you have been asked to look at some of the particular language of 1998 and what it might mean. The fact is you're doing this job in the here and now and based with all the experience and disappointment since 1998 uh, as well. And in terms of clear and present issues, uh, some of the things that we have been told were offsetting considerations uh, in the absence of a Bill of Rights, such as uh, the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights, uh, are no longer there. So I think uh, if we were told that part of the compensation for not having a Bill of Rights was that Northern Ireland at least comes under the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, I think one of the tasks has to be to say, well, uh, can this committee uh, look at saying, well, right, how do we uh, safeguard uh, those rights that are lost or jeopardised by the loss of the uh, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights? by making sure that they are included in supplementary or additional rights that could go alongside the European Convention of Human Rights in uh, a Bill of Rights. I also think that the committee has a job of work to do in trying to nail down that the commitment to the European Convention of Human Rights is uh, absolutely enduring. Remember, what the agreement did was it nailed down a commitment to the European Convention of Human Rights. That was to be an enduring commitment. And the planning permission was to add to that with the wider supplementary uh, Bill of Rights. So I think in terms of the British government uh, and the course it has set uh, in terms of how it can legislate on Brexit to just knock through the European Convention when it feels like it, uh, I think means that the committee needs to address the Bill of Rights as it was always intended to do as incorporating the European Convention on, on Human Rights, not as something separate to and purely an optional accessory uh, beyond the European uh, Convention, but also uh, some of the people in the past who justified not having a Bill of Rights have said that there were other rights that are there. Those rights are no longer protected or given in the same way. Uh, we know they're in jeopardy in the future. So if people were committed to the language of the Good Friday Agreement then, why won't they commit to the spirit of that and maybe in the sense of a renewal review of the agreement say, well, right, how do we frame uh, proper understandings and undertakings and rights into the future? And the one other point I would make is to cross-reference the issue of petition of concern, which I don't want to get bogged down in, but the more in which we are able to point to citizens having the rights uh, to challenge authority and to challenge decisions and to assert their rights in uh, the courts and in those mechanisms, the less reliant parties will find themselves having to be in the more negative safeguard practices uh, in the Assembly that can give rise to some of the excesses and abuses around things like the Petition of Concern, uh, which wasn't properly legislated for and still hasn't been properly reflected even in the Assembly standing orders. But I think it makes it easier for people to move away from those sorts of clumsy process safeguards if we have uh, given more to the citizen. And uh, as I reflected in my submission, even as far back as the talks, you know, we could sense that there was a difference. Some people saw a Bill of Rights as a badge for the system. Other parties saw a Bill of Rights as a shield for citizens. Uh, and that fundamental difference is still going to be there, muffled or otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, the, the one concern I would have, 
about the idea of a renewal or a review of the Good Friday Agreement is uh, I personally wouldn't trust the current British government with the shopping list, never mind with the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and given the state of the international community, we don't have those dynamics in terms of the, the, the strong American interests. Of course, there's still senior American politicians and figures who are very, very interested in the Irish political process and, and who have continued to, be, to cure and nurture it. Uh, we're losing the European Union element of, of that oversight as well. So it may not be the best time for such a review. Yeah, I'm not advocating to say full-blown renewal review, but I, I do think that's the basis in which we have to have the conversation because some of these people are saying that the way in which they are dealing with Brexit doesn't affect the letter or the spirit of the uh, agreement, which I think invites the question then that the rest of us need to remind them of what the spirit and letter of the agreement uh, should mean uh, and and what it should mean in, in, the, in the lights of this generation uh, in 2020 uh, as well, based on all the experience we've had, because the experience we have now of the way in which the British government is legislating actually reinforces the case for a Bill of Rights and for these sorts uh, of protections, uh, not just for the citizens, but also to protect the devolved institutions, because it's the standing and locus of the devolved institutions that are being undermined as well by uh, aspects of the Internal Market Bill and some other Brexit-related legislation. But uh, I, I'm worried that in the absence of saying let's have a renewal review or something that is rooted in the Good Friday Agreement itself, we get bits of the agreement knocked off here and there and people say, oh, but it's still the Good Friday uh, Agreement. And we see more and more bits of it knocked off and knocked down uh, and cut through and we're still trying to say then, oh, but we don't want to have a renewal review. If we're letting people take away chunks of the agreement, uh, we're not defending it by then saying, no, well, we can't review it uh, in any way or challenge people as to what it means uh, in this day and age. And yes, there is a huge risk of that in the context of the current British government. Uh, this is a government where, not just in relation to the Good Friday Agreement, but anything to do with rights, you know, it's like asking Attila the Hun to mind your horse uh, if you trust them with dealing with some of those issues. Uh, but the fact is, we have to deal with the terms uh, that we have. So I'm not a golfer, but I know that the rule of the game is play the ball where it lies. Well, I don't play golf either. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. OK, thank you. Thanks, John. No other members have any other questions. So, Mark, at this point, I would thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and for your submission. And uh, you can take your ease now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we'll now go to agenda item four, Chair's business. So, we have the, the questionnaire. You'll find this at page 108 of your pack. The questionnaire that we had uh, discussed last week, and there were some minor amendments that uh, the chair or the committee had discussed during closed session uh, last week. So the agreement was that the clerk would make those amendments, bring them back, and if people are happy, we can sign off on this and, and get this up and running uh -huh. within the next couple of weeks. Everyone's content. Yep, it's fine. Perfect. Right. So that's agreed. So we then go to. Matters arising, I don't have any. Correspondence, again, we don't have any. The next item then, number eight, forward work programme. Um, sorry, the minutes, did you agree there? No. Sorry, I fl sorry. flew through them, so just <laughs> agree the draft minutes from last week, apologies. Yeah. Um, does anyone have Agreed. anything? Yeah. Happy yeah. enough? Yep. Yeah. Right, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. So the next bit then, matters raising, we have nothing, corresponds, we have nothing. Forward work programme, we have um, presentations again next week. The following week is recess, and then we'll be back again on the 5th of November. The Chair, just in relation yeah. to that, obviously the 17th of December is also recess, but we have a uh, presentations in, in that week too. Oh, um, okay, let me check. Check okay. that. So the clerk will look at that and come back. So if no one has any other business, we can close the meeting. <laughs> next, next meeting this, this day week, two o'clock. See you.